Welcome to Saddle Up Live, a transformative podcast tailored for women aged 40 and beyond, where courage, God's grace, and a touch of sass are the driving forces behind conquering life's challenges. Join me, Lisa Kosky, as I take you on a captivating ride through the multifaceted aspects of womanhood in this vibrant stage of life. We are covering everything from my journey through breast cancer, the intricacies of marriage and the joys of motherhood, to the exciting adventures of grandparenting. In each episode, we saddle up for candid conversations about God, health, relationships, family dynamics, and the beautiful chaos that comes along the way. But here's the twist. Saddle Up Live goes beyond navigating the highs and lows of life. It's a platform dedicated to sharing what we have learned along the way. I want to help women thrive through it all. Together, we'll uncover actionable strategies for personal and professional development, providing you with the tools and inspiration needed to blaze new trails and seize every opportunity that comes your way. Moreover, we are committed to helping you suffer less and live more fully. Through our discussions on God, health, wellness, and mindfulness, we explore practical techniques for managing stress, cultivating resilience, and embracing a holistic approach to self-care. So whether you're looking for practical advice, heartfelt stories, or simply a supportive community of like-minded women, saddle up and join us on this exhilarating ride. Because at Saddle Up Live, we believe every woman deserves to thrive, flourish, and live her best life, no matter her age or stage. Welcome, listeners. I am extremely excited to have you here today. And I have somebody that I've just met and I told his name is Ed Vargo. He is the co-founder and president of Burning River Advisory Group. And I'm going to be honest, Ed, when I was like, I was working. So here's the deal. I didn't tell Ed. I'm sitting here in a flannel shirt and my baseball cap because my listeners know I'm trying to grandma more and work less. So I had a little workout class. I got to go clean a horse stall after this. So I'm like, well, I can either skip the workout class or, you know, make myself look good or I'm going to show up in flannels. And so I'm sure Ed got on this call and was like, who is this (laughs) woman? But I promise we'll be a little bit professional. But the reason I'm excited to have Ed here is we're going to talk about financial things, but I feel like Ed has a little bit of a twist um, because he is devoted to helping women. And he's going to share his authentic story as to why. But I thought this is going to be a great conversation for both my Doing Divorce Different podcast and my Saddle Up Live podcast. So usually I do two different interviews, but I'm not doing that today. This is going to air on both podcasts. And we're going to talk about um, why it's so difficult to talk about money with our spouses or otherwise. And how can we remove the emotional responses? And Ed, I jump in because I have emotional responses to money and I think I got a little better about it. So I'm going to, I want to talk to you about that. And then he's going to give us some quick little tips and tools about finances. And finally, what we're all interested in, whether we're getting divorced or we're at this stage of our lives is how to raise financially educated kids. And I've got two that are fully grown. I think I did okay. That baby one that's pulling up the rear, who's out in college, I don't know if I did as good with her. So Ed, I think you're going to be a wealth of information, but I'm excited to have you here. I'm excited to get to know you better. And I really know that the listeners are going to be really interested to hear your story as to what led you to help women deal with finances. Welcome. Oh, I have to say one other thing that excited me. He's got five girls. He's a dad of five girls. <laughs> so you got to love a guy like that. So Ed, welcome. Thanks for being here. Well, thank you, Lisa. I appreciate you having me on. I think that's what most people, when they hear my story or the start of my story, it's like, you have five daughters. I mean, is that for real? <laughs> and they're really the, the love of my life. I mean, they're all older now. They're between the ages of 19 and 25. So I, they're not old, but they're kind of step, some are stepping into adulthood. 
and kind of finding their way on their own. And of course, some are still tethered to the nest. But my story, as far as why I've focused my attention and my businesses, I actually have two businesses, Burning River Advisory Group, as you mentioned, that's your, a traditional wealth management business, kind of what you would think from most financial advisors with a twist, in that we are unique and we predominantly work with women-led households, either single women or women-led households. And in our industry, that is very much the exception and not the rule. So mm -hmm. there's a story behind that. And it dovetails into a new company that we've started called Enlighten Her, which is also a financial company, but more financial coaching versus traditional financial advice. So it's taken the learnings that I've garnered over the past almost 25 years in personal finance and bringing it to the masses, so to speak, because as a financial advisor, we can only work with a relatively small number of people. But with Enlighten Her, we're going to be able to reach out on a much broader scale and help those, whether you're a multimillionaire or just starting out, we can find a way to, to help women. And that's really where my story starts when it comes to working with women. So I think of it like the tale of two cities, right? So I have my daughters today. And much of what I do revolves around helping them, putting them in the best possible position to go out into the world, be good humans, do good things. And we're trying to do our part, my wife and I, in terms of raising um, good humans, right? just good people. And my story originally, though, starts with my mother. And so my mom is an immigrant from South Korea. My father and her met during the Vietnam War. He was stationed in Korea. They met there, got married, and a little bit of the American dream at the start of this relationship, came back to the United States and proceeded to have four children, um, but it didn't quite go so well. So you know, the relationship soured and they end up getting a divorce. And that's the, the other side of this tale of two cities because my mom, unfortunately, because of, for many reasons, one, a language barrier, cultural barrier, um, an economic barrier, she was not able to maintain custody of us children. So. It was an anomaly in the sense that, I mean, divorce wasn't quite so common back then. And my father ended up raising us. And my mom really didn't have a, she didn't have any options, quite frankly. And that's where I look at this. And I think of that as a travesty. Like my mom had to give up her four children because she felt that she couldn't raise them because she didn't have the financial means to do so. And so as I pivot, you know, I carry that with me throughout. I didn't realize how much of an impact it would have on my life mm -hmm. as I got further into it. But I've carried that forward into a lot of the divorce work that we do because we see a lot of women who come into our, you know, we're obviously a, a business that focuses on women who are going through a difficult time like divorce. And I just never want to see a woman, really anyone, but a woman in this case, have to face what my mom faced, having to make real life decisions about whether they have their kids with them or not, because in this case of a financial issue. So. Okay. So see, I knew that I would love talking to you and I love it when people go through something difficult and then they help others. You're honoring your mom, you know, by doing this work. And on this show, I often, I'm just getting teary eyed, but I, I do often um, really want to comfort women so that they know if you're a stay at home mom and haven't been working for a while, I don't want them to be afraid if they're facing divorce. And it's so, it's interesting because what I've said in the past is there are things that can help you like spousal maintenance. And, but then I think of your poor mom years ago, and I am hoping that that story would be different today. For your mom that if she were in that predicament today well for one she could go to someone like you for some support but i would hope that the legal system would support that more are you finding that i actually have no idea because this is kind of a new topic i just thought oh no you're going to be safe you're going to get spousal maintenance for at least a period of time until you can afford to do this on your own your mom didn't have that and she i can't imagine how that was for her, I, you know, you know how much you love your children and then to be alone in this country. I mean, did she lose all connection with you? Was she able to still connect with you or how did that all work? Yeah, it was difficult on her, of course, and difficult on us as, as kids, because I mean, I might've, I don't really exactly know how old I was, 
And that may sound strange, but just how these things happen and how life unfolds, it doesn't happen like in very def definitive terms, right? So there was a separation where we just thought she was staying at a friend's for a long time, and that became a finalized divorce. And that happened over a number of years. So it's it was tough on us because we were told one thing, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I'm sure our parents were trying to protect us. And my mom is very traditional. You know, the Korean culture is very different than the culture here in the United States. And that was part of the barriers and to her, her willingness or her understanding of what her options were. So, you know, my mom, um, in her mind, was like, she felt like, well, I can't take care of them. I would be doing them a disservice by right. trying to have them at home. You know, yeah. I would be harming them by yeah. keeping them, right? You can, yeah. you can understand a mom yeah. thinking like that. And it was tough on us too, because again, we really didn't know, you know, exactly what was going on. So to answer your question about how it unfolded, there was a bit of a, a time where I don't say we were estranged, but where we didn't have a lot of contact. And there's four kids, you know, so each of us took a different amount of time to reconnect with our mother. And that was born out of our own understanding of the experience and how we felt. And, and I'll, I'll won't go through all the details. It just took me longer to get over it. I'll say that. Mm -hmm. And eventually we did, and then we mended, and things are great now. Um, we have a great relationship, but uh, it was a very difficult time going through that. And so today, could that happen? I would say yes. Yeah, I would say it's less, yeah, it's possible because what they're in the divorce arena, there isn't somebody looking out for you. There's no one coming and guiding you and taking you by the hand and saying, hey, here's how this works. Now, we have the internet, we have Google, we have a lot of, we're more socially connected, right? So we can go out and find more information. But if somebody was faced with a similar situation, a language barrier, my mother couldn't read the language, couldn't write the language, had never, has never driven a car. Um, so she was facing a lot. And so, yes, hmm. that could happen today. I think it's, it's certainly far less likely. There are far more resources available. And socially, there are more resources available. So I think that that exact scenario happening in that way is, far less likely. That said, there's still a major barrier when it comes to the understanding of how the divorce process works. And there is a lot of misinformation or a misunderstanding. And again, there is no entity that's going to come in and save the day. The court system's not going to come in and say, oh no, you're getting an unfair deal. That's right. not really how it works. Right. And so, you know, one of my key messages in working with women, whether you're going through divorce, just starting out as one of my girls might be stepping into the mm -hmm. professional workforce or any bear, any, anywhere in between is you really have to advocate for yourself. Mm -hmm. You can't be passive. You can't expect others to do or take care of you. And I, we're, in my relationship with my wife, it's a fairly traditional household right now. My wife doesn't work outside the home. She was a NICU nurse for a long time. You have five kids in six and a half years, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's enough to take care of at home. So she was certainly working in the home. But it's really important for whether you're in that situation or you're on the front lines and the primary breadwinner, you really do have to advocate for yourself and start to get educated about how the financial world works. You don't have to be a whiz. You don't have to know the ins and outs. You don't have to be great at math. You know, there's a lot of things, a lot of thoughts that uh, sort of self-limiting beliefs that, you know, women have when it comes to money that holds them back. And some some guys, you know, a lot of men don't have those safe, same self-limiting beliefs, right. whether they're competent or not. They're just some things that um, the way men think about money allow them to step forward, where a lot of women are just standing on the sidelines or even stepping backward. Yep. Okay. So that kind of brings us to the first question. Why, why is that? Why is it difficult for women to talk about money? Like it is, it's getting better. I've been married almost 33 years and it's finally starting to get a little bit better. And I'm going to go a little bit deeper as we keep going, but why is it so hard for women to talk about? You know, that, I don't think there's a one right answer to that. It's a multitude of things. Certainly there is a sort of just how you were raised kind of idea right now that is changing slowly, but surely, but it doesn't, and it doesn't account for everything, but we learn from our parents. Right. And so if you're not having conversations at home around money, it's very much unlikely that your children are gonna to start to have those conversations, and particularly for girls or for women. And men tend to talk about money nat more, more about money naturally than women do. And so some of the studies out there have shown that in general, this is a broad 
you know, painting with broad strokes. So just take that into account. Mm -hmm. Men have a tendency to be to gravitate towards things, and women have a tendency to gravitate towards relationships. Not surprising, there's a lot of male engineers and there's a lot of female nurses. And so that natural tendency and money is a thing. So talking to my girls, talking to my wife, talking to other females and women clients, they don't gravitate toward the money as much as their male counterparts do. So yeah, it's an, I think it's an interesting it's interesting I because I just had a little light bulb moment. I was going to ask you a question about this, but it, it is so true what you just said, because I think about my childhood and I know that my father did his very best. He really wanted us to understand finances. And sometimes I almost think it's harder when we were fairly well off, not super well, you know, just kind of, but never was a Hard, you know, money wasn't hard to come by where my husband's family, it was harder to come by. And he learned about finances naturally. Like, you know, I've got to work for this. I don't want my dad to spend the money that he needs for groceries for this, where I knew that my dad was saying, you need to pay for your own college um, because he wanted me to understand. And when I was, tw I think I was 12 years old, my dad had this plan. I don't know where he learned it, but it was he was going to give us a, a certain amount of money, my brother who was two years older and myself, and it was a pretty good allowance. And then we were to go and take care of everything that we needed. So at 12 years old, I would buy whatever I needed for like school clothes. And, and I had a, an allowance, but like if I ran out of money, I couldn't go to a movie with friends, right? I mean, that was how he was. So my brother was Yahoo! He was so excited about it, didn't think twice. And I was like, what? I don't want to do that. You know, and I never said anything because I was very obedient and I would never have said that to my dad, which probably is an issue too, because if I could have just told him how I felt, but it scared me. And I think it actually made me look away from it. And like I survived, I paid for college. I lived off a bag of potatoes. I'd rather buy an outfit than food. You know, I mean, I just, I figured it out, but I never really healed that the way that I felt about it emotionally, where I like wanted to run away from it a little bit. And here you have the daughter and the son both reacting completely differently to the exact same situation. Right. It is interesting, right? So there are some societal things, and I think there are some nature and nurture things. And there, again, there's been plenty of studies in the, in the world of behavioral finance. Uh, and I won't step too much into this space because it's a, it's a big subject, but it talks about like, why do the premises is like, why do smart, let's say intelligent, educated, affluent people make the same mistakes as those who are less affluent, less intelligent, or less educated? You would think that the fourth, first group would make patently better decisions. And what they found behaviorally is that we're all kind of subjected to these behavioral or cognitive biases, which gets into the male female sort of dynamic. So as an example, there is a concept called loss aversion. It's just how much do you fear losing, right? So all of us, male and female are hardwired to where losses affect us to a greater degree than gains. Okay. Right. That's why when the let's say the when you lose money, it feels much worse than if you were to gain the same amount. So I'll give yeah. an example. Let's say that I said, Hey, I want to bet a hundred dollars, heads or tails. Heads, you win a hundred bucks, tails, I win a hundred bucks. And what happens is in order for somebody, the average person to take that bet, I would have to pay them two hundred dollars if they won, and, and they would only have to pay me a hundred if they lost. Gotcha. So the, we feel, even though it's the same odds and we have the exact mm -hmm. same odds, 50-50, but I have to compensate you to two times the degree to get you to take that bet. And that's because we're, fear of, we're more fearful of losing money than we are gaining it. And that psychological trait uh, carries forward in women more so than men. Women are typically more loss averse than men are. And so that's not just when it comes to money, it's kind of a a personality trait. And so we see this manifest itself in the financial realm in a number of ways. It could be men are more willing to take risk in the stock market than women are. We find that to be the case. We find that men are more willing to say, oh, I'll apply for that job or I'll put my head, throw my head in the ring for that job promotion, even though they may not be ready for it. 
Whereas a woman might look at that and say, well, I'm not quite ready for that yet. I don't want to do that. I, I want to just wait until I get ready. And then the guy's kind of throwing, you know, caution to the wind and saying, hey, I'm throwing my hat in the ring. And sometimes they get that job. You know, so there is some of that built into our sort of the fabric of who we are. And if we understand that, we can work to overcome those barriers. And there's plenty of, you know, cognitive biases that affect males in a way that's not so positive. Um, it, the key is really just to understand what those are. And so when I look at my girls, what I'm trying to do in raising them and instilling the proper money mindset, and I, I don't think you asked me this question, but I'll, since I'm going down this path, yeah, I'll, yeah, yeah. I'll just walk down it. But I think a lot of women, mothers, want to know, well, how do we raise smart kids? Like, uh, I think what I find with a lot of, say, women in their 40s and 50s, or even 30s, 40s, and 50s, but if you're a little bit old, there's 40 and 50, and certainly into your 60s, you look back on your life and you're saying, gosh, if I only knew then what I knew now about money, I would do things differently. And the whole, the company, Enlightener, the whole idea, the genesis behind that idea came from that thought. How do we have the greatest impact on women for future generations? And we need to get to them earlier in life. If I can get my girls to understand money, uh, at least the, fun, the foundation, they don't have to be a whiz at it, just the foundation, the fundamentals of money, start to make good decisions at 18, 19, 22, 24, and not make the big mistakes that a lot of us have made, learn the hard way. Um, that's going to put them on a solid foundation, right? They're going to be able to move forward. And then they're going to be able to, because women are very social, and so they can start, and we have to foster this. I think this is definitely a part of that barrier that you talked about. Um, and just not talking about money, we need to foster this idea that it's okay to talk about money. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be taboo. It should be just like anything else. In fact, money is one of the most important resources. I think it's the most valuable personal resource that you own, that you have access to because it touches everything in your life. It doesn't mean you have to have a lot of money, but you have to be smart and do good with it. And the better you are dealing with your money, it has a multiplicative effect on your life and it can enhance all kinds of things in good and bad ways. And I have to say another light bulb moment. This is very healing for me. So as you're talking and remember I was telling you my dad, he treated us both the same, right? M myself and my brother. I think it did have some positive effects. Like I said, how I was didn't want to do it and I was afraid of it. But as you were talking about the gains and the losses, I am a person who is more like a man where I go for it. I take the risk. Very, and I thought, well, that's interesting because that might be a gift from my parents for how, you know, for them starting me so young and understanding what it really was, what it really meant. The, you know, understanding that, well, if I spent it on this, I couldn't buy this. And maybe going through college and living off potatoes to have nice clothes was the way to do it. I, I don't know, but it worked. And so that was, that's interesting to me. So as we talk about, and we're kind of jumping into how to raise financially educated kids. And you were saying, you know, to make sure that, especially your girls are comfortable with it. Are there any other things that my listeners would want to to hear that could help with their kids, even if they're young or if they're like heading off to college? Yeah, absolutely. I think, first of all, I think it's, it's totally okay to talk about money. That's the first thing, right? Money sometimes gets associated in a, in a negative light, right? Like we assign negative characteristics to money, but that's really in, in, in unfair. Money is um, neutral. And so yep. you can use money and your relationship with money could be very negative or it could be very positive. So I think of money as a relationship. I think we need to nurture that relationship. We need to cultivate it and we need to share it. And so the first thing would be is, okay, it's okay to talk about money. Now you don't have to talk about everything and you don't have to talk about things that are, if you find personally uncomfortable. So as an example, what I don't tell my girls is like how much money we make as a household, right? I don't get into those types of details, but we talk about money all the time. But not in a way that you might think a financial advisor might. So I, I am not out there having a lecture. I don't have a whiteboard going through different mm -hmm. financial concepts. That's never happened. But we, I think one of the biggest things you can do is, again, by having your conversations in front of them, modeling good behavior. 
So let's just say, even if your financial situation is a mess, right? Now, let's be honest, some of us have a bad situation and some are very good, and we're everywhere in between. That aside, we still want to model good behavior for our kids, right? Even if we're a mess, <laughs> we still want yes. to hold it together, yes. present the right front to them. And I think modeling that good behavior is very important. And one of the ways you do that is you, you have to give them agency over money. You don't learn how to deal with money until they have money in their hands. Because the thing about, and I'm not going to get to an economics lessons, but there's this idea of scarcity. And so if you had unlimited supply of money, you wouldn't learn any money lessons because you could just spend it on anything you wanted and just more money would show up. That's why so many of those who are very wealthy are out of touch because most of us just can't do that. They haven't learned the concept of scarcity. You, it's hard to teach scarcity without living it. Amen. And so you, right, you lived there, right? You grew up, you said you struggled a bit. I know exactly what that's like. That was like, I grew up in an inner city neighborhood in Cleveland. And my father, single household, blue collar, steel worker. We had basically nothing. Right? And I won't get into that whole story, but I know what scarcity is like. And fortunately, my girls, I mean, we haven't always been as fortunate as we are now. And because we had them over a certain period of time, they've experienced different levels of scarcity. But what I've always done is put some money in their hands and then coach them on it. And at the youngest ages, it's just saying, hey, here's, here's 20 bucks you get for Christmas or for your birthday. It's your money. I always tell them you could spend it on whatever you want. Now, granted, if they're six years old, I'm going to put a lot of parameters around that. Um, they don't know what to do. They don't know how to think about money. But I'm going to start that process and say, look, you have five, you have $20. It's really important that you always save 25% of this. Or save five, spend 15. And then we can talk about what, what does it make sense to spend that money on. And you got to let them make mistakes. You have to let them blow through that $15 in an instant, and then they're gonna ask you for more money because they want something else. Now that's a lesson that you can teach them right there. It's like, well, you could have only spent $5 and held back 10 and you could have both of those things. Or, you know, it starts to teach them lessons about like, if I spend it on X, I can't get Y. Now, I'm not saying you do that five or six years old. I think that when they start, I mean, we should talk about those types of things. I mean, you can start it as early as you want. Um, but if we start talking about those things in front of them, when they're in their sort of tween years, you know, 10 to 12, I think it's a great time to start to have those conversations, put money in their hands. I think paying your kids for chores that are not for the family, this is my opinion. Okay, we have five kids. Everybody had, we had a chore grid. Everybody had, you know, their chores for the week. And that was to help the household because we're all in this together. However, if I asked them to do something that was beyond the household good, and it really was like taking of their time, why not compensate them for them? Mm -hmm. you know, what, what's $20 or $10 to get them to wash your car or to, you know, to do something for me personally, not the household? What mm -hmm. I've done is I've taught them a lesson that money just doesn't come from the ether, it comes from going to work. Yep. That's how it works, right? For most of us, you gotta go to work to make money. So I give them a chore, I pay them for their job, and I say, hey, it's your money. However, let's talk about you know, how we should use those dollars, et cetera. So I think that's really important. You have to let them live it. And then as they get further along, before they get outside the house, and they're kind of like, you know, at some point, I think a lot of teenagers kind of turn off from their parents, you know? Yeah. So I try to, I try to get to them before them, for that point where they're not really listening to me. And I just start to share bigger concepts. And that's a whole, you know, that's a longer conversation about the time value of money, like why investing early is so important. Yeah. And now that's a little more financial advisor-esque, I'll give you that. But I, I really think it's having and fostering this conversation and tie in money, scarcity, you don't have, you know, complete dollars, and you got to work for it. And then you can have those conversations about college, like your father had with you. Yeah. Like, We're not paying for this, or we can't pay for this, or you have some skin in the game because when it comes to college, and this is another rabbit hole, I think so many kids today don't understand that college costs money. I mean, they understand it costs money, but they don't know what that means. Right. When you're 17 years old, you don't know what $10,000 is compared to 50 compared to 100. It really, they really don't understand and get that. And they're not going to get that unless we really step in and try and instill that for them. 
You know, and as I'm listening to you, and I have a great relationship with my parents, um, but I think that, you know how I said my husband, his dad worked in the mines, you know, he had, he had a rougher childhood. He didn't want his dad to pay for his college. He didn't want to take away from his retirement. It was a little harder for my parents to teach me about money because I think I felt, and I never said this to him, but I think I felt a little bit like, why are you making this so hard for me? You could afford to pay for this. And I think, Ed, it's affected my parenting because I'm a people pleaser. I'm learning how not to be now that I'm a grandma. But I think that I, I mean, and I, I have great kids and they're doing amazing too. I, one's a physician, one's a dad of two girls so far. Um, and then my baby's in college. And um, I don't know. I just am feeling like I'm so thankful right now as I listen to you for those lessons. And it's harder for somebody who's maybe not going through a hard time to teach their kids the value because the kids might get mad at them. You know what I mean? They might be like, I don't understand this. We have enough money. Why can't I do that? And so I may have failed my youngest a little bit by, you know, she's the baby by far. And, um, she was adopted and I think I lavished her too much and she's in her second year of college. And I just was thinking as I'm talking to you, it's never too late. I can just have this conversation with her and, you know, start talking to her about scarcity and about why I maybe just let it go a little bit too far where she maybe had more than she should have you know, to help her understand that. And then she does like to talk about investments. She took a, a class and was really into stocks. And so maybe we do need to get a little further. I think you were going to say something. Yeah, well, what happens, depending upon your childhood, your upbringing, or your social economic condition, the, 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 in my case growing up, I didn't have to seek out these money stories. They came to me. I lived it. So right. my kids, you know, they're they're much better off than I was growing up, thankfully, right? That's what we're trying to do. But the money lessons, they're not so evident. They're not so obvious. There's no strife. There's no struggle, certainly for the younger. And if you have uh, multiple kids or a number of years, right, socially or economically, you tend to start low and then work your way up, mm -hmm. right? So where my oldest daughter's upbringing and her financial experience, her experience with money as um, I sort of told through the story of my life, right? Like, cause my, my financial situation flows down to them. Her experience is very different than the youngest. Right. Just like you were saying there, the young, my youngest has had access to more of everything than my oldest, simply because I was further along in my career and in my life in a better financial position. My oldest learned lessons much more easily around money because they just showed up all the time. I could say no. I, because I had to say no. Right. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't <laughs> right. have to make it up. I'm like, right. no, we can't do this. No, we can't do that. We have to do all these different things. Now with the youngest, I didn't have to say no as much. And so it's really important that we as parents understand that the environment that we're creating for our kids is not the same from one to the other. And for your youngest, like you were just saying, you may have to initiate these conversations. And it's not too late to have those conversations, even if they're adults. Um, but for me, and for, for anyone in this situation, you may have to initiate those conversations more often versus just stumbling upon a teachable moment. Right. So it requires us to be a little bit more aware of what's happening in that, that child's world and how is she looking at the world through her eyes. In my case, they're all girls, so um, in her <laughs> eyes. But, uh, but that's, there's, a, there's a real amount of truth to that. And so, um, but I really think that there's no, there's no, too late. It's never too late. We work with a lot of women who are in their 50s who have gotten divorced or lost their husband um, from, from passing away, and they're starting over. Mm -hmm. And they're just now starting to try and figure this out. And they're learning lessons at 50 and 60 that they never thought they'd have to learn, but they're certainly capable of learning them. Yeah. And it's a blessing, the learning. You know, we go through hard things and we learn and we grow and it just makes life fuller, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, character, you know, all these cliches about, you know, rough times, difficult times builds character and that's yeah. where growth comes. But there's a, a lot of truth to that. I firmly believe that. Yep. Yep. 
Well, Ed, I went over time with you. I rarely do that. I really, really, from the bottom of my heart, am so thankful that you were here, that I had these light bulb moments. I hope, I'm sure listeners did too. And so I'm just grateful that you've been here for doing Divorce Different and Saddle Up Live. And I think I want to talk to you again about that college daughter. <laughs> maybe I need to do some coaching. Uh, or maybe I can have you back to talk about kind of helping kids through finances. Because I think that is another issue too, Ed, where they're kind of coming back home. And it is hard right now. Um, they're coming back. I have a lot of friends whose kids are coming back home and living at home, you know, because they can't afford a house or whatever it is. So maybe that's a subject for another day. Sure. Well, I appreciate you having me on today. And if it makes sense for your audience and they like this well enough, I'd be happy to come back and impart some knowledge. I do have a strong affinity for that group. My girls are right there. They're mm -hmm. at this stage right now. I know what that world looks like. I know what their friends are talking about. And there is, and we can probably end on this, but the reality is there is a lot. I just had this conversation with my, my daughter the other day. She's like talking about her friends and he's like, they want to know about money. They want to learn more about mm -hmm. it, but they don't know where to go. It's like their parents aren't talking about it. The internet's a quagmire. So they just, they don't, so they don't do anything because they don't really know where to turn. And so there's a real opportunity. And I firmly believe that generation, this generation that are just coming into the workforce now is the key. So if we could get them trained up, get the, just the fundamentals, it doesn't have to be enough to be on Wall Street, just get the fundamentals right at this stage in life. And that just, well, you'll carry those positive trends throughout your life. And chances are you're going to share that not just with, with everyone or the women, at least in your backyard and your extended family. So yeah. I think there's a real opportunity there. I totally agree. Ed, thank you so much for being here. And listeners, if you want to find Ed, I'm going to have information in the show notes, but where's what's the best thing to do if they want a little help? Yeah, I think if you're just starting out or you're in the divorce space and you're trying to figure that out, I would go to enlightenher.com. There's uh, some great resources there, whether you're just getting started on the financial side. There's a piece about nine money myths. It's a free white book, white paper. You can get that or we have uh, 12 steps to safeguard your financial and emotional well-being if you're on the divorce side. I think those are two great, free, um, actionable resources. One of the things that we be believe strongly in is not just about putting information out into the world, but actionable information. Mm. And my, my business partner, who happens to be a professional woman, she's so adamant about that. She says, look, I just don't want to hear some great idea. I want to know how to take this and apply it in my life. We need to build a guidebook or something like that. And that's what we've done. I love it. Okay, listeners, go there, find that. It'll be in the show notes. Thank you, Ed. Thank you. Appreciate it. Take good care. Thank you for tuning in to another empowering episode of Saddle Up Live. As we conclude this exhilarating journey together, don't forget to subscribe, share your thoughts, and become a valued member of our vibrant community. Because as always, every woman deserves to thrive, flourish, and live her best life. Until the next time, saddle up and keep conquering those trails.